All right, my turn to talk, and um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the points uh, that I'm going to make in my in my talk were touched upon in, in, uh, by the previous speakers, but this allows us to look at it from a different perspective and maybe focus on some of the other things, uh, some of the points. It's titled Management Challenges in Non-Tuberculous Mycobacteria. Um, so as a disclosure, it was paid by INSMET to head an advisory board meeting about, their, about the liposomal amicacin for inhalation. And um, for the outline, so for each of these, for each of these things, I'm gonna uh, share what what's supposed to happen, and then some of the practical issues that we deal with in real life with our patients with each of these, uh, with, uh, with each of these uh, points. This list is in no way comprehensive, though. Now, the, the Lady Windermere uh, reference has been uh, brought up a couple of times, and I thought a few years ago when um, I got interested in this disease that I should know about Lady Windermere. So I read the play and, and found no connection <laughs> at all with this disease. So I asked people smarter than me and so on, like, where did this doc, and the reference is there, this Dr. Reich or, or Reich and, and Chest in 1990. Uh, wh why would he make, I don't know if, if you've uh, uh, read the play, but it's some um, high society England, this, uh, this lady who's throwing a cocktail party and a lot of gentlemen are trying to win her her favor, so um, perhaps NTMIR should stage a play or something or a field trip and, and make this play, no. But um, I, think, I think the connection that, that he made was that he imagined uh, that Lady Windermere would suppress her cough because of etiquette. And he hypothesized that that was one of the pathophysiologic factors that led to the accumulation of mucus and infection by, by non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So regarding the management challenges, so the first one that we've talked about, how do we diagnose it? So uh, the, the last version of the, of the guidelines have criteria that uh, we use to diagnose. Because we, as we've learned, just finding um, NTM in a respiratory secretion is not enough to diagnose. We've seen a wide variety of disease processes appear in these patients. So we've added in addition to microbiologic, there's clinical and radiologic criteria. So you need to have typical clinical um, with the cough and phlegm, the, micro, uh, the, the radiologic, which we've seen some of those radiologic features. But the problem, as highlighted now by Dr. Selfinger, is that there's over 200, almost 200 species. Can you generalize these criteria to all 200 species? Obviously, the answer is no. And um, uh, when, these, when these guidelines were, were developed, uh, you know, there was a lot of focus, obviously, on the most common of the non-tuberculous mycobacteria, but even among the three most common, Kansasii, Abscessus, and MAC, there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, you can apply these uh, criteria, different levels of, of uh, um, you can be more or less strict with these criteria in just the first, the, most, the three most common. Um, so I put 120, that's, that's a very low number, obviously, as we've seen, it's almost 200 at this point. And, uh, and as I said here, it's unrealistic to expect that these would apply to all the species. Also touched upon a little bit before, when, when do we treat? You may have different thresholds if you speak to many of the different doctors in this room, um, but one thing we can say, and also said that it's an ongoing conversation with the patient. This study that I'm sharing here from, from Japan in the late 90s, they wanted to see what happens with these patients if we didn't treat, we just observed. It's just 57 patients, so it's a, it's a low number, so again, generalizability is a problem, it's a low number. But they have 57 patients, and upon diagnosis, did not treat and observed and followed several, uh, they followed several things, including CT scans, sputum cultures every three months, and a, and a bunch of laboratory uh, checks for inflammatory markers, CRP and ESR, and uh, they categorized the patients into a deteriorated group and a non-deteriorated group based on clinical, radiologic, and, and microbiologic criteria. They found that 60% deteriorated 40% did not. And they have, an, they have in the group of, of deteriorated some factors that they, uh, uh, that they found may have been associated 
with being in the deteriorated group. Female, mean age 69, BMI is lower than the non-deteriorated group. The mean age is, is uh, about 10 years higher. Smear positive, being smear positive also, predicted that you would be in the, deter in the deteriorated group, and then a higher percentage of neutrophils in the bronchial lavage fluid. And just to highlight how different patients have different uh, trajectories, this is, uh, you know, one of my patients that, that I had in my clinic, and um, she was referred uh, because upon workup for ovarian cancer, was found to have abnormalities on the CAT scan, nodules and so on. So she was referred. This is what her CT scan looked like. There's uh, bronchiectasis and some nodules in the right middle lobe and lingula are affected along with some of the other uh, lobes. So pretty typical so far. And she had a bronchoscopy. The bronchoscopy was smear positive and eventually grew MAC. When you take the history, you, you try to get a feel for how bad the symptoms were. And she had very mild symptoms, just a mild clearing of the throat every morning. We didn't start treatment, although she was, uh, they were, uh, she was planning to have a pretty aggressive chemotherapeutic regimen and debulking surgery for her ovarian cancer which she did. We never started treatment. We kept following her closely. Almost every single sputum culture was actually smear positive. We never treated the CT scan. We followed with CT scans. They remained on average the same, with some nodules disappearing and some new ones appearing in other places in the lung. Her symptoms stayed the same, and her pulmonary function testing also stayed the same. Her ovarian cancer went into remission and then recurred, upon which she got more chemotherapy and another surgery, and we never treated the MAC. Her MAC never progressed. And this was someone who was going to be relatively immunosuppressed with the chemotherapy that she was going to receive. Just highlighting some of the difficulties we have on, in, in predicting which way the patients are going to go. And of course, as highlighted, there's so many different species, and even MAC, Mycobacterium avian complex, we've, we've grouped them together, but there's several species within this complex. Um, you know, there's some data showing that perhaps intracellularity would be more pathogenic. Should we use this clinically in our, in our decision to start or, or, or not, or in our decision to start treatment? Um, let's say we decide to treat. What happens then? So just as a review, this is the treatment we've, we've uh, been over in our previous talks. Uh, clarithromycin or azithromycin, rifampin, ethambutol. And you can choose three times weekly or daily based on if it's cavitary or nodular or if it's severe bronchiectasis. And consider intravenous medications uh, in the more severe disease uh, or cavitary disease. And continue until culture negative for one year. This is what we have so far. Dr. Wallace uh, and his team published this in CHEST in 2014. And um, there's some characteristics of the patients uh, that they had. Um, but specifically, about 86% reverted to negative. So about 8.5 out of 10 patients actually converted to culture negative, responded to treatment. However, right under that, you'll see that 14% of these relapsed, so the MAC started growing again while they were on treatment. And not only that, but for patients who completed therapy, there was a 48% rate of recurrence. So it's important to talk about all these things with the patients. And do all these things affect our decision to start treatment? We have to make sure our patients are on board with, uh, with all of that data when we start. For one thing, these treatments have a very high rate of adverse events. It's multiple antibiotics, and it's a very long time. You know, some of these, some of these medications are used like, like the ZPAC. It's, so, it's one of the most commonly prescribed antibiotics now. Take it for five days, seven days. It's prescribed so frequently. But what if you were going to give it for 18 months or two years or two and a half years? It's not going to be so easy to take it. This, in one study in, in 2006, greater than 90% of patients reported at least one side effect. And, uh, this is consistent with clinical practice. 30% of patients even change clinical regimens. 
And of course, there's the issue of interaction with other medications. Rifampin, of course, is the biggest culprit there. Not to mention, we're having difficulty relating the, our laboratory findings with what happens clinically. Drug susceptibility testing being a big thing. For many of the antibiotics, it's difficult to um, relate drug sensitivity testing to clinical outcomes in MAC, lung disease. And then, of course, there's the issue of, of macrolide resistance. z azithromycin, and or chlorithromycin, as I said, is one of the most commonly prescribed antibiotics. Are we going to start seeing an increasing rate of macrolide-resistant NTM lung disease now that we're using uh, azithromycin more for other indications, like long-term to decrease uh, COPD exacerbations or long-term to decrease bronchiectasis exacerbations? Not to mention that a large majority of patients are out there and are not being treated with, uh, with the correct antibiotics. This is from uh, one of our speakers, Dr. Ajemian and, and, uh, and Dr. Griffiths, the next, the next person coming on. And they basically surveyed uh, patients and docs around and uh, checked how many are actually being treated with uh, guideline recommended therapy. So here are a list of, of, uh, of their uh, inclusion criteria for patients to be eligible. Um, seen by a physician within the previous t uh, 12 months, diagnosed with m abscessus or MAC, and currently under the study physician's care, and, uh, and did not have tuberculosis. It was an eye-opening study. Only 13% of regimens prescribed to patients with MAC met the guidelines. So all these challenges that I'd mentioned before may be contributing to all of this. Is there a knowledge gap also in a lot of these physicians treating? So there's many questions that come up here about why many of these patients are not being treated with the recommended therapies. And, and uh, you know, down for abscesses, as you would expect, it, it was, uh, the, the numbers were even worse. Only 7% of patients met the guidelines. So as a summary, it's hard to generalize the clinical criteria, the, the criteria for diagnosis to different species. And in patients, there's a wide severity of symptoms. Patients may have different goals. It's an ongoing conversation. So we're going to have different, we may have different thresholds of starting treatment with, with, with uh, two patients who may, uh, who may seem like they have similar uh, disease uh, severity. Uncertain natural history of the disease also creates a lot of problems in, in predicting or giving advice to our patients. Comorbid conditions, of course. And then something that, that I didn't talk about in detail, of course, is the cost of medications. I mean, uh, I've had patients come to me and, and say, hey, I didn't get the hypertonic saline because the copay is so high. Hypertonic saline is salt water. Yeah. I'm not sure how that happens. If somebody here knows, I would, I would love to know. Maybe we're, there's something that we don't know that, that we're, we're not able to, to figure out here with, with that salt water that's so expensive to make. And then, and then of course, um, all the adjunctive therapies uh, and airway clearance therapies also, um, they, you know, they, they can be a pretty uh, significant cost. And the inability to tolerate uh, medications, as I, uh, as I mentioned. Thank you. That's it. And for, with that, Dr. Griffiths. <laughs>